I was very interested to take the opportunity. I think this is going to give us a problem with the microphone, sorry. Uh, hello? Having two microphones so near, we have to split a little bit. So, I was very interested to take the opportunity to connect what you just presented with uh, some earlier work, since your questioning of consciousness, I think, has been um, present in, well, back to very early um, books of yours, especially in how we became posthuman, in the whole, uh, in your whole elaboration of the, of the posthuman, even much further back in Chaos Bound, for example, um, thinking of how um, you were placing then already the question of how the posthuman was at the same time opening up uh, this field of distributed cognition while it exhibited the danger of reproducing uh, the liberal subjectivity of the self, uh, precisely because of the um, ways in which uh, people like Wiener and Shannon were, were elaborating cybernetics, cybernetics and information. Um, well, how has, how has how have those problems, those problematic modes of distributed cognition are going on now, including all these new uh, non-conscious cognitive agents? Uh, so, I would like to place the question in what I would call the era of the quantified self, which is uh, so we are living uh, in, in an era, in a time in which at the same time as we have all these enormous uh, and mostly for us invisible um, non-conscious agents which are deeply choreographing our, our becomings and our beings, at the same time there is a massive uh, exponential uh, and problematic, in my view, multiplication of uh, certain instrumentalized aspects of liberal subjectivity through what is sometimes called, well, things, it's just one example, but the quantified self. So all these technologies that um, help uh, um, control systems who have ev people overexposed data, all sorts of data of their lives within uh, systems of various, various systems of, uh, of control uh, um, from ones, uh, some that are more consumer oriented like tracing people in the market systems to more uh, government oriented uh, systems of control. Uh, how, what, what would be, one question is what would be the relation, the complex interrelation now between uh, these emergences of n distributed conscious, uh, conscious co Co cognitive fields, let's call it, and the reproduction of uh, highly apparently uh, con um, incongruent uh, exponential multiplications of the self, uh, of liberal subjectivity. That's one, one, is one aspect. Okay, so um, when I wrote How We Became Posthuman, one version of posthumanism is transhumanism, and transhumanism is the idea that we can use advanced technology to make the self transcendent, to transcend our biological limitations, extend life, for example, or maybe even achieve immortality by uploading ourselves into a computer. So it's all about preserving the self, preserving the self intact, amplifying the self, rendering the self even more invulnerable to the slings and arrows of fortune, as Shakespeare would say. Um, and at the time, I could see that there were strains in posthumanism which pointed in the direction of distributed cognition. What I didn't fully anticipate then was what I talked about today that there would be a kind of form of, of post-humanism which would be about the cognitive non-conscious. And I knew, of course, that cognition was being distributed into objects, into the environment, and so forth, but that this would go along with a movement which um, began to understand much more fully the limitations of consciousness 
I didn't fully understand 15 years ago. So it's kind of ironic to me. You know, I think of the person who, the, uh, for me, the kind of ex extreme version of transhumanism, you have your head cut off and put into chirogenic suspension to be resurrected at some future date, maybe attached to a computer, maybe attached to a body, and yourself would remain triumphant and consistent and coherent throughout, and you'd wake up with exactly the same self that you were before you had your head cut off. So what that, of course, I mean, let's leave aside the fact that it'll probably always be technically impossible, but just assume it might possibly be possible, which I don't believe. But in any event, what that leaves out of the picture is change, and in f that the person who underwent such a transformation would work, wake up in an entirely different society that would function in a cognitively entirely different way, and rather than a intense reification and further transcendent notion of the self, what this movement is doing is in fact calling the whole idea of the self into question and placing more and more emphasis on non-conscious cognition. So the dismantling of the Enlightenment ideals, which I talked about in Posthuman book 15 years ago, is now almost complete with the gloaming that now the gloaming is almost not just a denial of enlightenment ideas, it's actually a reversal of the whole ideas complex built up in the enlightenment. Incidentally, give me some feedback. You can go up or down. What do you think? Up or down or sideways? You can go sideways too. You'll get this reference Is this a consensus? All right. <laughs> All right. What was thanks the consensus thanks about for the feedback on my term, the gloaming. Can we adopt ah, the gloaming okay. as the antithesis of the enlightenment? No, why not, Ava? It's too bulky. Okay, Ava says no. All right, well, thanks. Thanks. You've given me a lot to think about. Maybe you'll talk with me afterwards and tell me more extensively why not. Yeah. Um, so, given as we said that there, would, that there are potentially infinite modes of distributed cognition, would you say that the current um, modes uh, of distributed cognition or non-conscious agency that are happening, in case that we can analyze them, possibly it's not possible to, to chart them like in, under a single kind of paradigm, but uh, in case that there is like a mainstream tendency in which they are being developed or that they are emerging, would you say that they present um, uh, an optimization of the kind of control systems that the self was uh, making available? So if we consider the self as problematic not only because of the many arguments that you were uh, providing, but also as part of a, a liberal tradition, an imperialistic tradition, as, as part of a highly problematic political and historical uh, contingency, would you say that the shift, this gloaming, this shift towards uh, power now operating mainly and disguised, disguised perhaps through this quantified self that makes us think still that we have this self still operating, but maybe disguise behind this, uh, would you say that these non-conscious agents are tending nowadays into an optimized version and a new uh, paradigm of control? Or do you see in them potentials for something different that would generate an ecology of relations that is not set? Well, I think this idea has a really interesting and complex relationship to the Metabody Project. You could certainly say that, for example, surveillance techniques are a prime example of the cognitive non-conscious. These are non-conscious objects. They're capable of discerning patterns, which is a cognitive activity. Those patterns can be harvested for all kinds of nefarious purposes, as we in the US have discovered to our dismay 
recently. Um, but at the same time, there are other vectors in this cluster of ideas which align very nicely with the Metabody project. For example, the idea that the reified self is an illusion and that what actually is happening is much more complex, dynamic, uh, and distributed and conflictual than the reified self. So that goes along with a lot of what you've been talking about, about shifting alignments uh, and so forth. So as in many complex cultural phenomena, I don't think we can assimilate this in any simple way to either a panoptic uh, paradigm or to a liberatory paradigm. There are elements of both of these in it and um, it's also not true that the cognitive non-conscious can only be used for hegemonic and oppressive purposes. It can also be used in many, many good ways. For example, the cognitive non-conscious in the form of data mining has been able to determine causes of rare diseases which were never possible before because they happen so rarely in remote locations. So it has it's like anything, it's complex, it's complicated. So I don't think we can, I think our task is to be more specific and to identify strands within this cluster that, and how they're moving without trying to simplify it in one way or another. Indeed, and uh, I, again, like reconnecting with um for example, in Chaos Bound, you beautifully describe this moment, this crucial turning point in which uh, when Claude Shannon defines information as equivalent to entropy rather than order, as was the case with physicists or chemists at the time, and you describe beautifully how that was related intrinsically to the fact that he was uh, an engineer working for Bell's laboratory. So the increase uh, of uh, entropy in information was seen in that instance as a crucial uh, element for capitalism to grow, where communication itself became not, not, no longer a means, but a, a, a form of capital in itself. So I see that as a crucial turning point in which nonlinear dynamics theories, chaos theories, theories of complexity, became in that instance, so if we go to analyze particular instances and see the complexities of each one, uh, I see that particular instance as a problematic one in which chaos theories are appropriated for, and maybe I ask you because maybe I have a very biased one-sided vision, so, uh, but in my vision uh, I see it as very oriented towards uh, optimizing uh, a system of capitalization, of capturing novelty. So power now operates no longer, since then especially, in terms of reproducing given, uh, given choreographies of our ways of being in the world, but of generating the new as something already preempted within networks of capitalization. I see it as a very significant, crucial point for how power operates now, since then, and increasingly. But again, maybe I have a biased vision. I would like to know what you think about this. Okay, so I'm going to channel Claude Shannon. Sorry? I'm going to channel Claude Shannon. I'm speaking now in Claude Shannon's voice. <laughs> so Shannon is really someone I very much admire because Shannon tried to say over and over, my work is very specific. It's about electrical engineering. And Shannon's work led to some very important theorems that greatly increased the efficiency of communication. Now, I understand your viewpoint where you could say, well, what Shannon did was to help capital commodify uh, information. And to a certain extent, that's true. But Shannon also greatly increased the efficiency of signals through channels. By increasing the efficiency through channels, he enabled information to be transmitted much more economically than was ever possible before. We could say that Shannon's work laid the basis for the internet 
And now we have the question in the form, is the internet a tool of capitalist oppression or of liberation? And I would say again, it's complex. You can certainly find a thread through it that is about capitalist oppression. At the same time, you can find other threads which are liberatory, as in the way that um, cell phones were used in the Arab Spring, for example, to resist dictatorships. So I think it's a mistake to try to characterize these broad, pervasive, dynamic systems in a simple way. It doesn't mean we have to ignore the nefarious uses to which they can be and are being put, but there's no simple way to offset those costs against the pluses that technology also enables. So I think it's a mistake to try to come up with a yes or no answer to a my, my view, a misguided question, and I'm not implying you would ask this question, but if you really wanted to be simple-minded, you would say, is the internet good or bad? Answer me, yes or no. Well, you know, how are you possibly gonna answer a question like that? It's the wrong question. So I guess that thinking of Shannon, I admire Shannon. I thought, I think his achievements were remarkable, and Shannon himself kept saying, don't try to expand my results to the cultural sphere. They have nothing to do with the cultural sphere. They're about electrical engineering. But anytime you get a really powerful, good idea, people are going to you know, appropriate it in their own ways and take it in places that the originator may perhaps never intended. Yeah. So perhaps one way of, of approaching this, again, through another of Claude Shannon's crucial um, uh, turning points of defining information as a disembodied pattern, the question of embodiment. How has this, the problem of, of embodiment versus disembodiment, how has it shifted recently as networks, as networks which are part of the internet, are increasingly um, including and generating new forms of uh, capturing data or translating data of all sorts of uh, aspects that we would called bodily or embodied, like biometrics and things like that. We have increasingly networks that are made up of, of, uh, well, of data that come from sensors that are placed on bodies and things like that. Um, so again, of course, it's not a question of yes, no. Uh, it's not now a question of is it bad, is it good, what's, what's, what's going on there. But how is the notion of uh, embodiment itself how is it problematized and perhaps preempted when this enters specific technogenetic spirals? So a technogenetic spiral, as Catherine has explained, when we produce a technology and the technology reversely engineers us and so on and so forth. So for example, we have um, a network, a biometric network that uh, captures or data from, from our sleep, uh, from our brain waves, whatever, uploads them on the network and so on and so forth. How far does that particular kind of uh, bodily, if not embodied, maybe we would have to see if that's a bodily or an embodied network, if it's taking the body as a given or if it's allowing for a becoming to, to happen. How far is that technology um, or I guess it's not a question of yes, no. Again, we would have to, I would have to analyze what is problematic in that process in terms of how the technology is shaping, is generating a new perception and a new body. So it's technogenetically generating a new body, a new perception, and then if that perception and that body would, were intensely capitalized, for me it would present some problems, but perhaps it would not be the only thing that it gives. So. Yeah. yeah, so my colleague Mark Hansen is, um, has a book coming out all about the missing half second and the way that media of the 21st century are going to target that half second for capitalist purposes. So if we agree that consciousness is always belated, it's possible to have media which are aimed not at consciousness but 
at the non-conscious or the unconscious before consciousness is able to process that information. And his hypothesis is that the media of the 21st century are going to be increasingly targeted to that half second. So we've already had some 20th century predecessors of that idea. Subliminal advertising would be an example of that. But now, with the increased biometric possibilities, the possibility for media that address that missing half second is greatly proliferated. So what that means is there's now this whole new terrain of space-time opened up, we can call it the space-time of the missing half second, to be exploited by capitalism, corporations, and so forth for their own purposes. And what's particularly threatening about that from a conscious agential point of view is that it all happens uh, under the radar, literally under the radar, which consciousness might have an attempt to counteract that through rational means. And there's been a lot of work in this area. So, uh, for example, Alex Pentland has this book called Honest Signals, and he's developed a, a technological device he calls a sociometer. And his argument is that, well, I think you mentioned this in one of your presentations, that most of our actual communication with one another happens uh, not only non-discursively, but non-verbally. And so he argues that using this sociometer, he can predict how people are going to act long before they know how they're going to act. And it's a little bit like Antonio's analysis of the violin player playing in ensemble versus playing by himself in this subtle posture or posture cues that enabled us to distinguish one from the other. So all of this subtle cueing goes on continuously in ways that we appropriate retrospectively and rationalize and confabulate. But what's really happening is prior to the confabulation, and it's what's prior to the confabulation that actually is efficacious in determining the result. So, for example, one of the things he does is go to one of those speed dating bars where, you know, people are rapidly interviewing each other to find out if they want to give, exchange phone numbers. And he's able to present with about 95% accuracy within the first minute of whether this couple is going to exchange phone numbers or not based on all the nonverbal cues that is going on in their conversation of which they're consciously unaware. And then he uses the sociometer to anticipate people's reactions to all manner of things before they themselves are aware of how they're going to act. So that's another example of this missing half second and the significance of it in terms of not just social interaction but commodification as well. Yeah, I guess it would be possible maybe to associate that missing half second with uh, what Deleuzeans call the virtual, I don't know, uh, and so how capitalism captures that virtuality. But what I would like to focus on for a minute is uh, going now to Metabody and to what, what we have been proposing these days of uh, focusing on the illegible, on the noise. I, I see this very related to Chaos Bound to, and, and how we became posthuman when you explain the ways in which, in the new paradigm, noise, uh, what is not yet being reduced to patterns, becomes crucial, becomes a field, a positive field, a generative field. It's no longer the negativity of uh, what is inexistent, but it's the creative field of potential, so a field of virtuality, in a way, in the sense of in the Deleuzean sense, philosophical sense, not in the sense of the virtual reality as it's usually uh, expressed. So um, I was just wondering if you have encountered, um, like in your knowledge of literature, or of uh, techno-scientific uh, research being done nowadays, projects that want to focus in a similar perhaps way or, or, a, or an interestingly resonant way with this issue of uh, foregrounding emergent, uh, uh, not even patterns, because uh, what Metabody is attempting to do is not to produce emergent patterns, but even to 
bypass the notion of pattern altogether, which is a different issue. So to understand pattern as something that, whose conditions are certain perceptual grids. So what happens when we bypass or we disalign those perceptual grids and patterns are no longer possible? What affective kinetic relationalities c could emerge in such a process which is no longer mediated by these super-aligned interfaces of screens. So Can I just wonder, wondered whether you have come across things that would resonate with, with the project or even, you know, your own ideas or, or feedbacks. Sure. Well, I'd like, to, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce another idea here that Jaime has spoken for a couple of days now about misalignments, disrupting patterns and so forth. Um, I want to speak in favor of making patterns more robust. So, more robust. Uh -huh. Here's my analysis of where we are at the present. My analysis of where we are at the present is that we're deep into complexity and complex adaptive socio-technological environmental systems. And these systems have now become so complex that even the most powerful computers cannot predict what's going to happen next. We might see this as an opportunity for resistance, but I see it as the opportunity for huge ecological and financial collapse. That what we've done by intercon interconnecting and interlinking all these systems is to greatly increase their fragility. To, and make them vulnerable, the entire system, to small perturbations. A good example of that is the 2008 financial collapse, where a small perturbation in the system grew and grew and then threatened to bring down the entire global economy. So if you're going to talk about destabilizing patterns, I would ask, are you prepared for the consequences? One of the consequences of that is total global financial collapse. Are you prepared for that? And what that would mean? Are you prepared for global ecological collapse? Have you really seriously thought about what that will entail? So I have a huge vested interest in making complex systems more robust. I can understand why you might want to disrupt a hegemonic system that you see as all pervasive, but Personally, I think that verges on a paranoid fantasy, that the actual system that we're in now is precarious. We're all about precarity. And if we're all about precarity, then maybe our emphasis should shift from disruption to how can we make this system really robust? How can we make it so that it can absorb perturbations without endangering the entire complex system. So that's sort of, that's a counter position, I guess, to the rhetoric of disruption. It's the rhetoric of robustness. And I just want to speak in favor of robustness since we haven't heard much about that. But to me, that's, that's where we are right now, is trying to think about robustness. But how to put this in a relation with an uh, ontology? So what is the relation with the current collapse of, uh, of, of this field of complex patterns? Uh, intrinsic with the, with the platonic ontology of form. Do you see a relation, an intrinsic relation there it's between... It's ab absolutely opposed to platonic ontology. Sorry? It's absolutely opposed to platonic ont ontology. It's all about emergence, it's all about complexity, it's all about mutual and unpredictable adaptations. Plato didn't anticipate all any of that. He was, you know, lost in a vision of transcendent order. This is not about transcendent order. It's about seething, dynamic, complex, unpredictable, uncontrollable, adaptive systems. So but it's would, totally anti-Platonic. What would be the place of uh, visual control systems in that field of emergence as an would you see that as a platonic kind of inheritance, this domination of a visual grid of control, or do you still see that as... Well, the Pentagon and other forces that be are trying to institute control in some part of these complex systems. 
We could include the SEC. We can include the U.S. government. They're desperately trying to control some part of these complex systems with a stunning lack of success. A stunning lack of success. That the systems are too large, they're too integrated. I don't think that our problem right now is hegemony because the Pentagon is no more in control of the war of terror than the SEC is in control of the financial system. You know, why are we still fighting the war on terror? Obviously because they can't win the war on terror. If they could win the war on terror, we wouldn't be fighting the war on terror. So it's obvious that they're desperately trying to do something which isn't working very well. And it isn't working very well because they're in a complex adaptive system trying to control some small part of it, but the consequences spread outward and are essentially uncontrollable. Mm. Well, in my view, uh, what, what is a crucial part of this system as it is operating now is this affective makeup of the quantified self, as I was saying before. Um, do you see Myself. there? really doubt that it's very efficacious. So, you know, I'm sort of, I don't, I don't buy into this idea that we're in the grip of hegemonic control. I think that hegemonic control is an illusion that the powers that be try to project upon us to suggest that they're really in control of what's happening. I think what's happening is far too dynamic and distributed to be controlled by anybody and highly subject to unpredictable emergences. And that really scares me. So, you know, I, I'm not about disrupting pattern. I, I like to see ways to reinforce pattern and have a little more stability in our financial and governmental and uh, communication systems. No, oh, I mean, well, of course, corporations want to make money. Yeah, and I, I've actually started a project on finance, capital, and cultural theory. And it's my idea that one way we can combat this tendency of corporations is to go back to the idea in the 1930s that was prevalent in the US not of the shareholder value corporation, but of the social corporation that had multiple stakeholders, including the community. And so I'm not, I don't think we can do away with corporations, but what we can do is contest their narratives of legitimation and uh, begin to think of corporations in ways that are not simply driven by shareholder value. And in fact, the more you look into the ideology of shareholder value, the more shaky it gets. People don't understand this in business schools. They propagate the ideology of shareholder value as though that were the only ideology that's possible. Well, that's simply not historically accurate. It's not factually correct. And it needs to be corrected. And the people who can correct it are people like us who have the historical resources and the cultural training to be able to deconstruct those narratives. So to me, that's a much more feasible way of operating than to say I'm going to do away with capitalism. Because frankly, I don't think that's in, a, in the cards. So if we're not going to do away with capitalism, then how can we reform capitalism and in what directions can we reform it? And I think we can start with the ideology of shareholder value because that's a real vulnerability and a powerful ideology operating right now. So if we have a different model of the corporation, we can begin to change that whole ideology. You, you can see I'm very practical minded. It's like, okay, what can we do, you know, and what are the consequences of doing A versus B? Part Let's open up if you want. No, we are out of time. No, but I think we should go to Havilland and then discuss on the way because really it's very late and we are starting to. Let's just okay, in the 30s there was eugenesia parallel to this thing and 
contributing to, it is not separated, eugenesia, cap this capitalism of the 30s, uh, this uh, sort of thought, and combined with a precise thought of human beings and gender and the rest of the world and the relations. These are not separate things. Politics, gestures, uh, and technology are the, sa uh, the same thing, basically. You know, we are social, historical, cultural beings. And, uh, and I think this is very nice because there is an urgency you know, to solve things, but it's also risky. I think we should also complicate a bit history, you know, and this sort of politics, because it's more complicated than just creating a cooperative or something like that. I think we should rethink all of it, because I think it is so pretty, pretty strong and hegemonic that we fancy that uh, we are individuals. We behave like that, and we believe, we feel that way. So perhaps we should, I think what is very important about this project is that uh, force us to rethink from very different point of view uh, one very complex thing, not to solve it, but to, to have perhaps another perspective. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Let's go have lunch.